Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Everyone, welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. This is Erica Adler, Retzel shareholder and leader of the healthcare practice. And today I'm with my partner, Donna Hartle, who is an attorney, a CPA, and chair of the tax department at Retzel. Today, we're going to be talking about some year-end tax consideration, as well as some current trends in tax. So Donna, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you, Erica. Uh, so let's start then. You just jump right in. What are some year-end considerations that people should be thinking about. We're November 1 today as we record this. So these are really, we're getting towards the end of the year. Okay, so some things you should think about as, as the year is ending are a couple things uh, that might help you either this year or next year. Uh, many of those watching these videos have uh, office buildings. You know, some people don't rent, some people actually rent from a building that they own. And you can take sometimes accelerated depreciation to give you an additional write-off if you do something called cost segregation. Cost segregation separates out some of your personal property or items within your office that you can accelerate quicker than you accelerate the building yourself. Because every asset for tax purposes has a span of life you can depreciate over. And if you do a study and you can break those out, some of the stuff you can write off faster. So if you want to consider a cost segregation study, give us a call. We'll, we'll tell you what it entails and, and if you want to do that. Uh, your accountant should be able to help you with that as well. Um, another issue that we see come up is if you refinance your business, your building, some uh, debt you have uh, personal liability for, some debt you do not. And the way that's categorized can affect how much losses you can take in your business if you're a partnership or an S corporation. So if you find refinance and go from a type of debt where you were personally liable to a type of debt where you're no longer personally liable, that may affect how you can deduct losses. So if you're about to do that, consult with a tax attorney, consult with your accountant, just to make sure that you still have available to you the full amount of ability to deduct your losses. Um, another is to think about just simply accelerate expenses. You can't prepay five years worth of expenses in one year, but you can prepay a little bit. So if you have an insurance bill that's due January 1st, pay it in December. If you have property taxes, pay them in December as opposed to January or February. So look at what you have coming up in January, February, and March and see if you can accelerate any of those expensive expenses. Another, is, another one you may want to look at, and, and I say this with a little bit of trepidation, is if you qualify for the employee retention credit, for 2021, that window is still open to file through April of 2025. I caution you because the IRS is all over this. So if you have a very clear path that you definitely qualify, think about looking at it. And again, call somebody at Retzel or call uh, your accountant to go over that. I will qualify all of this with the comment that it is November 1st. The election is November 5th, and what happens on November 5th or the ultimate decision may also sway what to do. So just keep a look <laughs> on, on who wins, what their tax proposals are, because their tax proposers are, are very different, because you may want to do some end of the year changes uh, in anticipation of what's going on, for example, you may want to do some gifting to minimize your taxable estate. Uh, one candidate's plan does not have a huge difference in what is now. The other candidate's plan has a huge drop. So 
watch what happens after the election. And uh, again, consult with a Retzel attorney or, or with your accountant, because you may want to do some end of the year gifting to maximize what the rules are now. Another part that people look at a lot is uh, how to make sure I keep my records correct in case I get an audit. And we have been seeing a very strong uptick in audits of professionals, and they hit a number of different items. And so to the extent you can be prepared for this, an audit will go much smoother. Number one, if you have a home office, the IRS is really focusing on home offices these days. You can have a home office, but you have to make sure you are very clear on the rules. If you bought a new home and built out a home office, you have to have a very clear delineation on your invoice of the contractors. On if the, What part of what you paid them did they work on for your home office? What part did you pay them that is part of your home? Um, same with expenses, same with property taxes. If you have a home office, it will benefit you if you have all your ducks in a row to support the deductions you're taking for the home office and do it now. The other part that the IRS is looking at very closely are travel expenses and meals and entertainment. Travel expenses and meals and entertainment, you need the five W's who, what, when, where, and why. So every expense should have written either on the back of the receipt or on an expense report or on a log who you went out with, where you went, what you spent, the receipt for the expenditure, as well as what you talked about that was business related. It is supposed to be contemporaneous. So you really should be doing it as, as you do now. Whether And there's a lot of programs out there, Retzel uses one of them, where you actually can take a picture of your receipt and upload it immediately into a, a recording section. So that way you keep a good recording and it's considered contemporaneous. Now, we have been successful in audits in recreating some of those contemporaneous logs but you're going down a rabbit hole with those and your, your memory is not as good on something you did three years ago. So I really suggest, even if it's just going forward, start keeping those records of the five W's because that will help you tremendously on an audit because that's where I see some of the biggest exposure. We've Erica, do you have a question? Yeah, what about like your credit card receipt? So for example, you you uh, went to lunch with someone, you remember you had lunch with them, but you can't find the receipt, but you have your credit card bill, like how does that work? I've used that. Um, the receipt part is not as important as the five W's because if you can't prove the business purpose, because the credit card only really gives you the amount and the where, it doesn't give you the who, it doesn't give you what you talked about. Okay. And well, that's what you're not going to remember three years back. Right. So I'm just curious, since we're at the year end, what about things like holiday parties? I mean, uh, you had an expense, you're entertaining maybe people who you do business with, referral sources, et cetera. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, we had this come up in an audit this year and they asked, do you have a list of who attended? Or at least do you have a list of who you invited? Because you need the who. Uh if, and if you can put next for a holiday party, then I guess if you can put next to each name, if they're a client, if they're a referral source, just some kind of notation of why it's business related, wow. um, that would be important. But the IRS has asked me specifically for those receipts and a list of the people. Oh. Yeah, so they're getting a little, they're like a dog with a bone on those things. So <laughs> just, just be careful. And like I said, just, just, it, just keep the written log. They will be shocked when you hand it to them and it and it will save you a lot of trouble down the line. Great. All right. Um, other things, 1099s. Uh, if you have anybody that should be getting a 1099 because they're not employees, but you paid them, you have to make sure they they receive it. The IRS is specifically going to look for it. 
And even though you can prove you paid them, even though you can prove what it was for and that it was business related, if you don't give them a 1099 when required, they are going to assess you a penalty for not having filed the actual form. So don't assume that being able to just prove the expense is good enough. They are going to ask for the actual reporting forms. And the last loans, especially if you have an S corporation, a lot of loans go back and forth, whether it's from the company to you or it's from you to the company. Make sure you, do you document it with an actual loan document. IRS looks for it and they want to see it. Especially for S corporations, loans can be used as part of the way you can deduct losses. So if you do not document that loan, the IRS could come in and say, well, then it's not a valid loan and that the losses that you tied to that loan that you could deduct, they'll disallow the losses. So again, it's a matter of just documenting things. Don't just say, look it, I put money in. It was clearly a loan. They actually want to see the loan document. So make sure you document it. Here you're talking about loans be from the owner of the entity, between the owner of the entity and the entity, correct? Or the entity to the owner. Or the entity to the owner. So how is it, what about giving advances, for example, to employees that's documented just as a a regular loan, or can you just do that on your books? Because I've had that come up recently as a question um, in a deal as well. So you advance some compensation to a doctor, uh, and then maybe you recoup it from paychecks in later weeks or something. Is the IRS going to be looking for that to be documented, or is that more like an internal computation? You know, I haven't had it come up. But I can tell you where I see an issue with that is on the employment side. Um, I, I would talk to an employment lawyer, which we have here at Retzel, um, but to talk about the fact that if you treat it as an advance, I know there are meant, there are some rules that you have to have something in writing if you can later uh, reduce recoup it, recoup that from a paycheck. Yeah. So, so just just make sure those laws are complied with. I, I'm not sure what those are. So, and, and then the last is S-Corp distributions. A lot of people with S-Corps take money out and they treat it as a distribution, not a wage, because then you don't have to pay payroll taxes on it. The IRS is focusing on that because we had an audit this year where the physician took a $20,000 salary and took hundreds of thousands in distributions. And the IRS said, no, no reasonable doctor would work for that amount as an owner of a business. So they they recharacterized some of the distributions as wages, which then created payroll tax um, that was owed that wouldn't have been otherwise. So I also suggest working with your tax attorney or your accountant to come up with a reasonable wage if you're going to be taking both wages and distributions. And don't only take a distribution and no wages, because that will that will flag the IRS. That makes sense. Uh, the third issue I was I have seen come up, and it's come up more recently, not just with um, medical professionals, but with all tax professionals or our tax uh, clients, is changing states. During COVID, a lot of people stayed at their vacation homes and then decided they liked it better. And then they decided that they could um, work from home a lot. So they decided they were gonna move into their vacation home. And we're, at, you and I are currently in Illinois and Illinois is pretty brutal about saying, oh no, 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 you didn't leave me. You're still coming back and forth to Illinois. So even though you spend, you think you spend all your time in Utah or Florida or whatever state you say you are now in, they say, no, prove it to me. And where many people get caught with Illinois is on the homeowner's exemption on your house. 
So if you have two homes, one in Florida, one in Illinois, and you want to say that you have moved to Florida, if you still have a homeowner's exemption on your Illinois house, Illinois is going to use that as proof you did not do everything you needed to do to move to Florida, and they will continue to tax your income. So as much as it is a facts and circumstances test, so if that's the only tie you had to Illinois, you probably will still win a fight, but you are going to have a fight. So my suggestion is, and I think I've had three clients this year that just forgot to let go of their homeowner's exemption in Illinois. So make sure you do that. We have checklists here at Rutzel. So we do have checklists about, okay, I want to leave Illinois. What is it I have to do? We have checklists that know what they're going to ask on an audit about what state you're in. So we can help you plan and do the things that you need to do that if you are going to change states for tax purposes, you extricate from your home state as completely as possible. Great. Uh, All right. those, those are pretty much my suggestions. Erica, any other thoughts or questions? No, I think that's great. And I just want to kind of mention that I get a lot of calls from, you know, doctors and other healthcare providers who are, um, you know, struggling with letters they got from the IRS or other tax planning. They may have a bookkeeper, but nobody really advising them on deductions they can take or or whether they're doing things right or wrong. And, um, you know, I think it's less expensive to ask questions ahead of time uh, to be ahead of issues that exist rather than waiting to hear from the IRS or finding out you could have taken deductions that you didn't or finding out that there were things you, you know, you should have realized you were doing wrong, you know. So I urge you, if you're listening to this podcast, to feel free to reach out to Donna. Just if you have a question that you've been wondering um, that you're not sure about, you're not sure it's an issue, you think you can handle it on your own, but you know, maybe you're wondering if that's the case, um, you know. You know, Erica, let me let me bring up one more thing based on what you just said, because I am seeing a very disturbing trend this year. The mail, the regular mail. IRS maintains that they sent out letters and the clients maintain they haven't received it. Even with us, when we're on a power of attorney, we sometimes don't get the letters either. There is a problem with the mail, both going into the IRS as well as the IRS um, sending you things. So I suggest two things, nothing, even a tax return, nothing should go to the IRS on paper unless you send it certified mail or FedEx. Anything you send, even if it's just a check, should have some proof of delivery because it's it's getting difficult now to prove that things were done. I also suggest you get on irs.gov and set up an account. So if you have things going on with the IRS, you can monitor it because don't rely on them to send you a letter because either it didn't go out or you didn't receive it. So I'm I, I am seeing this over and over this year. And so don't rely on regular mail in either direction with the IRS. All right, great. And there's so many things we could say about the IRS, but <laughs> we won't. I guess, you know, one final thought is also that, you know, taxes are going to be due right in the new year. And Donna had a really interesting experience um, with somebody who they relied on for tax preparation that they shouldn't have relied on. And I think a lot of time people might use friends, family, somebody they've known many years, but I don't know if I'm putting words in your mouth here, Donna, but I think the recommendation is to, you know, always confirm that the person preparing your taxes knows what they're doing, uh, that they're allowed to prepare your taxes um, and that they're really looking out for you. And don't just sign off on something that you haven't reviewed yourself. I know we've had some situations where people have done things on taxes as the tax preparer that, you know, the individual was not aware of uh, and didn't review, but yet signed off on. So um, that's, I guess, the a good piece of advice as people are thinking about who's going to prepare their taxes next year, right? Yeah, good, good point. Okay, great. Um, all right. Any final thoughts or are you wrapped up? I'm wrapped up. 
Okay, perfect. Well, thanks, Donna, for joining us. And for anybody who has any questions, this is Donna Hartle. She's head of our tax department here at Retzel and Andrews. Please, please reach out to her. She's awesome at handling any kinds of questions that come up, particularly for my healthcare uh, clients. And you can see all of our podcasts at ralaw.com. Thanks for joining us at the Health Law Hotspot. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Retzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice, and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.